Hello, everyone. It's the second Sunday of Lent at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Stewart, Minnesota. Merciful God, we thank you for sending your Son to suffer and give his life for all people. Teach us who have been born again to forget ourselves and rely only on Christ our Savior, for he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, beginning at the first verse. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me, for I continue childless? and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. 
and he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he didn't cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down, and it was dark, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The second lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the third chapter, beginning at verse 17. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Today's gospel lesson comes from the gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter, beginning at verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. In today's lesson, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. To go to Jerusalem means to go to his crucifixion. When Jesus was transfigured atop a mountain, this is what Jesus talked about with Moses and Elijah. Do you remember what they were talking about? This is what we read two weeks ago. According to Luke chapter 9, Moses and Elijah were speaking of Jesus' departure 
which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So not only did Jesus know what would happen, he actually spoke about it with Moses and Elijah in some detail, not to mention that Jesus also explained to his 12 disciples what was going to happen, though the disciples didn't want to hear about it. So there's a lot of meaning packed into that statement. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. But here in today's lesson, some Pharisees warn Jesus about Herod wanting to kill Jesus. They're just some random Pharisees who may or may not have been enemies to Jesus, yet this is ironic because it's much more the Pharisees that were a threat to Jesus than Herod was. As we know from the events that eventually happened, Herod wasn't nearly the danger to Jesus that the religious leadership of the Jewish people in Jerusalem were. In response to that Pharisee's warning, Jesus called Herod a fox. The meaning is surely that Herod isn't that much of a danger. He may be troublesome, he may be tricky, but Herod was simply a political figurehead. He's not really running the government. Jesus must encounter the truly powerful and dangerous rulers in Jerusalem, the Romans, the Sanhedrin, and the Pharisees. Realizing what ends up happening, we know that Herod was not the threat to Jesus that the religious leaders were. Later on, at the time of his trial, we read how Herod just wanted to see some of Jesus' amazing miracles. It seems that he had no idea of Jesus' signs and wonders being a threat to his authority. But on the other hand, in the fact that Jesus brings up his signs and wonders, Jesus' miracles were very much a threat to the religious authorities. And that's why Jesus spoke of those healings, those signs and wonders, those miracles in today's lesson in response to those Pharisees. Jesus is a prophet rather than a political leader like Herod. So it's his being a prophet that Jesus speaks of. In verse 33, Jesus says, it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. So the topic is the threat to Jesus's life. And it's the danger that a prophet like Jesus must encounter. That's why Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Anyway, Jesus tells that Pharisee to tell Herod, listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. That's the sort of thing that Jesus was surely speaking of with Moses and Elijah on top of the mountain at his transfiguration. The history of Israel and the dynamics of the situation with the Jewish religious leadership pointed towards Jesus' execution in Jerusalem much like other Jewish prophets in the past had been killed. When Jesus said this, he's surely pointing to the experiences of not just Elijah hundreds of years earlier, who had to run for his life from Queen Jezebel, but also of Jeremiah and the prophets Uriah and Zechariah. 
Jeremiah was almost killed in Jerusalem on a couple of occasions, but the prophet Uriah actually was killed at the time of Jeremiah, and so was the prophet Zechariah, as described in 2 Chronicles. So Jesus is being a prophet and going to Jerusalem to meet his appointed task and his departure. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus used the image of a barnyard fire. It's a big fire and the barn is burning down. So the mother hen gathers all her little chicks under her wings as the barn burns down. So then what do they find when they clean up the rubble of the barnyard fire? They find the mother hen burnt to death, but the chicks are still alive underneath her. This is a scene that they sometimes saw in those days. This is about destruction coming on Jerusalem. Jesus is predicting that the Jewish nation will soon be destroyed. It will be a matter of the Roman army marching into Jerusalem to completely wipe out the nation. That event happened in the year 70, about 40 years after Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead. But like the hen saving the chicks, Jesus will save his people from destruction. The Messiah is the savior of his people, his nation. The Messiah is like the mother hen, and the people of his nation are like the little chicks. So Jesus is our savior. He died for our sakes. He died so that we might live. He sacrificed himself for our sakes, for the sake of his nation, the kingdom of God. We're the little chicks saved by the death of the mother hen, who is Jesus. Jesus is talking about sacrificing himself to save the people of Jerusalem. He's talking about the cross. We will be saved through Jesus' death on the cross cross. Just like the mother hen died to save the lives of her chicks, Jesus said that he would die to save the lives of the people of Jerusalem. But the people of Jerusalem wouldn't turn to him for salvation. So Jesus laments that his death would be in vain for so many people in Jerusalem though his death avails for us, whose names are written in the book of life. His death avails through faith. Just like the mother hen calls the chicks to her side to save them from the fire, Jesus calls us to his side to save us from destruction. Through faith, we rush to Jesus' side for salvation. So that's faith. We're not talking about a quiz here. Faith in Jesus means to stick close by Jesus, like chicks sticking close to their mother hen, or to hold on to Jesus' hand in the face of death, to hide underneath his wings. So are you holding tightly on to Jesus' hand? Faith is holding on to Jesus' hand, even though You might not be aware of doing it. That's what you're doing. Jesus truly is right at your side and you are grasping his hand. Faith is not a matter of a pop quiz at heaven's gate. It's a matter of walking into heaven, holding on to Jesus's hand. Or faith is like a little chick rushing to hide under its mother's wings. How can you be more aware that you're actually walking through this life holding on to Jesus's hand or rushing to 
your Savior's side? The obvious answer is to pray, to read the Bible, to learn the gospel, to take Holy Communion, to come to Sunday worship services, etc. There are many things that one might do to raise one's awareness of being close by Jesus' side and walking with Jesus through life. We can be clearly aware of how we're walking with Jesus. That's what we're doing here week after week. That's why we do what we do in worship services. Christian faith is about going through life while grasping Jesus' hand. This is more than just a nice sentiment. It's absolutely true. We really are like chicks running for cover to their mother hen. In many real ways, that's what our lives should reflect, and that's how we should act. It's not only for when we find ourselves in mortal danger. We're actually in that situation constantly of needing our Savior's salvation. We should constantly realize that our lives are in danger and we're holding on to Jesus' hand for salvation. We truly are sinners saved from God's judgment. Faith is how we're constantly looking to Jesus for help in the midst of all sorts of temptations, suffering, and adversity. It starts right now, and we won't let go of Jesus' hand until we are safely in heaven, until we walk up from the Jordan on the other side of death. So, we live by faith, and it's not something of which we're unaware. Chicks know how to run to their mother hen when there's any trouble at all. We're that way also. We're aware enough to constantly turn to Jesus for help. And Jesus is always looking after us and calling us to his side. And this continues until we make it to heaven and walk in heaven's gate. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. joy and praise we pray for the church for those in need and 
for all of God's creation. Almighty and merciful God, it is by your loving kindness alone that you call us and train us to serve Jesus. Train us to pick up our crosses and make us worthy of our calling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we are following Jesus. May we so grab hold of Jesus' hand that we can be his disciples. Help us to faithfully follow Jesus. Our treasure is in his kingdom. Help us to always look to Jesus when we are in any trouble or distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, Son of God, we thank you for calling us to be your disciples. Strengthen us to pick up our crosses and to follow you wherever you lead. Help us to always make your kingdom our main and only treasure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, send us the Holy Spirit to give us faith, hope, and love, to carry out the tasks you've given us to do, and give us eyes to see your kingdom, which is not of this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, train us so that we'll be strong and able to withstand the temptations of Satan. Make us strong against all of Satan's attacks, whether in fear or anger or hatred. You are the one we turn to in any distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for Christians persecuted for their faith. Please be with churches in Egypt, Syria, Libya, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Comfort them in their sorrows and struggles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the people of Ukraine, and we ask for your presence with them and your help in their trials, in their struggles, in their suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us, Father, to stand up for Jesus in times of intolerance and persecution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help all Christians, Lord, to witness to Christ faithfully and with love. Answer them when they cry out to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort all who feel removed from you because of illness, crisis, or fear. Deliver them to a place of healing and embrace them with your unfailing mercy. We especially pray for healing for Nissi Langenbaugh, Kathy Nelson, Alma Jean Wagner, Sylvia Margraff, Ordell Klukas, Shirley Kirkhoff, Kristen Dewar, Alton Lean, Leon Crone, Diane Benson, Emerson Holman, Milt Spanton, Kathy Stadema, Keith Renner, Steve Sangren, Sam Schumann, Nancy Stewart, Keith Richer, Darlene Karg, and Donna Feigrum. And there are others that we raise silently before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember the family of Mike Kinney as they sorrow at his death, and the family of Jerry Myers as they sorrow at his death. Please be with those families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remembering your covenant that draws the saints into one community Join our voices with theirs in praise of all the good things that you do for your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we entrust to you all for whom we pray, confident 
that you fulfill your promises through Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. We pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.